Victor should be congratulated for organizing this brilliant series and Professor Garniki Nair for coordinating them. <coughs> On the first day, we heard Professor Gopal Guru telling us that a nation was a social creation that could only be articulated around notions of equity and justice. We also heard Professor Prabhat Patnaik, one of the pu finest public speakers we have. When Prabhat speaks, every word is so very appropriately in place. We can even hear the comma and, comma and the semicolon. <laughs> only Sanjay Subramaniam can hope to rival him. <laughs> Prabhat told us that we have an insurrection against the Constitution by anti-national Sanghis today. Incidentally, the Constitution was indeed burnt by them in Gwalia, even as they attacked Professor Shri yeah. yeah. In the second lecture, Professor Aris Sita told us how the quest for nationhood, freedom and justice was different in <coughs> colonized countries from first world ones. He drew attention to how the struggle against apartheid in South Africa was inspired by India's struggle for freedom. He said, you sent us a Mohandas and we sent back a Mahatma. The next day, Professor Arunima enthralled us by bringing in the region in the national imagination, dwelling in particular on Tamil Nadu and Kerala, where language and the idea of a Dravidian created a national imagination. As a Kannadiga from old Mysore, I know from Janaki Nair's extraordinary work, Mysore Modern, that Mysore rejected the idea of linguistic states, arguing that Mysore was already a multilingual state. Consider the Bangaloreans in JNU's faculty. Janaki Nair's mother tongue is Malayalam, mine is Kannada, Dhruv Raina's is Kashmiri, Andrew Lin's is English, and Siddharth Malar Rvapu's is Telugu. Each of us speaks at least three other different languages, if not four. That we have Kannada jingoism in Karnataka today is therefore ironic. <coughs> the next day, Aisha Kidwai spoke to us about language and nationalism. A national language, she said, was a dialect that came with an army, a navy, and an air force. She showed us how Hindi had been, in a sense, created, and how the sudden increase in Sanskrit speakers, both quintessentially political projects of the right. Professor Neva Nivedita Menon had us all dancing when she counted up which of us is indeed nationalist, as defined by the anti-constitutional Sanghis. Muslims are not, Adivasis are not, Ambedkarites are not, those who suffer certain consequences of development, such as the Narmada Valley survivors are not, <coughs> those who oppose nuclear weapons are not, JNUites are not, LGBTs are not, feminists are not, non-Hindi speakers are not, as a gentleman told me on the steps here last week. The real anti-nationals, she said, are actually quite a small lot. We need not be scared of, despite the contingent fact that they hold state power now. Incidentally, this Hindu gen this gentleman said to me, Ham aapko Hindi sikha denge. Which is really quite a bit of a waste of time since I find it difficult to learn a language that has no neuter gender, where Coke is masculine and Pepsi is feminine. <laughs> when modernism began in 1492, with the expulsion of Muslims and Jews from Spain, which also discovered the new world. I didn't know the Americas were lost. <coughs> this was a mistake, Hoigache. They were on their way to India. <laughs> Jews and Moors from Spain were offered refuge and special status in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire, like the Mughal, and unlike colonial ones, had something, a, a concept known as millet, perhaps translating into Milat in Hindustani, which basically meant that the ruling family could be Sunni or whatever, but others could have their own laws. We know that this is problematic, but we do not have to go to the so-called enlightenment to discover multiculturalism and its problems. So you had Greeks, Jews, Armenians, and all kinds of other people all living together fairly equably in the Ottoman Empire, unlike Europe, which waged wars on religion. France expelled Protestants who went on to build beautiful cathedrals in Cologne and the Netherlands, while England expelled Catholics or deprived them of citizenship. Jews were non-citizens all over the world. The Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Vijayanagara Kingdom, on the other hand, seem to have celebrated diversities. 
I remember a panel in Hampi showing Turkish horse traders and a proclamation from the king asking all foreigners to be treated with respect and dignity. Now, we do not want this European idea of a nation state. One language, one religion, one race. This is what inspired Golwalkar and continues to inspire the people waging war on us, inflicting terror. I'm sorry I've taken your time, but I wanted to show you how being a doctor in JNU changes you, transforms you for the better. I'm ashamed of the Indian Medical Association and its stand on JNU, but you... But we also must remember we have doctors like the Medical Friends Circle and the Jan Swasti Abhiyan who are standing by us resolutely. <laughs> I'm honored to invite Professor Tanika Sarkar, recently retired professor at the CHS, to talk to us today about Gandhi's nation. The CHS, as you know, is a bugbear of the current dispensation. <laughs> if they can close the CHS down, they wouldn't mind the rest of JNU going on. Incidentally, and irrelevantly, at a magnificent exhibition called Navras, curated by JNU's Professor Kavita Singh at the National Museum last year, we saw from the armor that Aurangzeb also had chappan inches. Thank you. <laughs> Tonika. Uh, I would request everyone to please settle down so please uh, people who are behind can also uh, access them. Uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm incapable of setting you dancing or singing. It will be a very boring narrative. But uh, we meet in very dark times with very heavy forebodings in our mind. And before I begin, I must say that in all my years of teaching at JNU, it was my great privilege that I learned much more from the students than I ever taught them. And it's an even greater privilege that this continues to be so, especially in these times. I, uh, the JNU students are born teachers, and I was just told that the two CHS students in police custody are giving lectures on... <laughs> You know, good luck to Bussy. We have... <laughs> exactly. We have heard these lectures for years and years. It's their turn now. Now, <clears throat> so let me begin. You are, all of you, by now, with all the lectures that have gone on, thoroughly familiar with multiple definitions of the nation. I won't go into all of them, but let's take on a few, we have, for instance, a British variant, rule Britannia, rule the waves. That is nationalism driving colonization. We have the Nazi kind, of course, the nation, our, my nation above all others, my nation above humanity, reason, <clears throat> morality. There is, moreover, religious nationalism that identifies the nation with the religion of the majority community, and which excludes religious minorities from full entitlement to it. On the other hand, we also have had vast popular upsurges in Asia and Africa, fired by anti-colonial, anti-racist nationalism. There is not always a hard and fast line, though, that separates them. No, no, no. <laughs> that separates them, thanks. But often a lot of overlap. There are people here who are much more qualified to speak on Gandhi's nation, but uh, I was asked and uh, I just thought of this. What I'll do is to briefly contrast Gandhi's national vision with a few alternative concepts. The contrast is useful to understand how Gandhi himself sometimes changed his ideas through open and honest debates with his adversaries. It also helps us to see more clearly the distinctiveness as well as some of the problems in his own understanding. Now, it has been so far one of the great traditions of this university, or for all universities that matter, <clears throat> really, that we 
exercise our critical and analytical faculties openly, even when they problematize figures that we deeply respect ourselves. And I say what I say in that spirit. Since we are pressed for time, I'll dwell on just two interrelated aspects of Gandhi's perspective on the nation. Is that okay? Is the, can you hear me? And that is poverty and caste. I'll not discuss the place of Adibasis, again there are better people here to do that, or women in Gandhi's nation, which I would have loved to discuss had I time for that. Nor will I really discuss his secularism, his secular nationalism, because Gandhi was so uncompromisingly secular that there's very little to discuss here, though there's of course a lot to learn and remember from that. Gandhi, let me just remind ourselves, always acknowledged his moral and spiritual debt to Christianity and Islam. He said with unwavering consistency that people of all faiths are equal in the eyes of God and nation. He also said that though he himself worshipped the cow, he would never force the worship on those who do not, nor would he tolerate violence in the name of cow protection. He said that Hindus must bear the primary responsibility for ensuring communal peace, for they have overwhelming numerical strength and people of minority religions, what a word minority religions, are vulnerable in comparison. Uh, he didn't exactly use those words, you know, he said he, Muslims and others, but uh, these days we have got into this minority religion. For nationalists, the nation indicates a single monolithic supra-entity that must rank, and a big must it is, rank above all other commitments and identities. The problem, and this is the critical problem, however, is that this paramount identity is always undercut by diverse and very deep internal contradictions within. What distinguishes one kind of nationalism from another, what sets them apart from one another, is how each manages such internal divisions. V.D. Savarkar, the powerful ideologue of Hindutva, defined the nation in admirably clear terms. Perpetual antagonism against an other, and the other is always, uh, you know, to be defined by those, uh, by the self-appointed guardians of the nation. Perpetual antagonism, he said, creates and consolidates national identity. And nothing unites a nation more than the presence of a common enemy. Nothing unites the nation more than the presence of a common enemy. The nation therefore needs an enemy. That's the first condition. The, the anti-national is the first condition for the creation and consolidation of a nation, according to Savarkar. His Indian nation was, once again, he was admirably clear on this, it was unambiguously Hindu in its cultural essence. And he said that the faith of all true Indians should have been, sorry, all true Indians, the faith of all true Indians have to be, has to be born on Indian soil. So that immediately, without his having to mention it uh, separately, that excludes Hindu, sorry, Muslims and Christians from entitlement to the nation. <clears throat> but was a single Hindu nation possible, imaginable, given its internal contradiction? Here Savarkar had some interesting things to say or said he said some, interest, uh, said some things in an interesting way. And let's look at that. He did refer to caste divisions among Hindus. He admitted that upper caste power is founded on a historical act of conquest. But having said so, he immediately dismissed caste inequality as a problem worth, you know, going any further with. He argued that over centuries, the blood of high, quote, high, and low castes, quote and unquote, high and low castes, has mingled, creating thereby a shared identity, a single family whose differences do not matter one whit. 
His family metaphor was a subtle and powerful one, as it both admitted and evaded hierarchy in the same breath. You know, he, he admits it and, you know, uh, he doesn't have to do, dwell on it. Where does Gandhi stand? He organized vast anti-colonial movements with all social classes and categories in India, all possible social classes and categories in India, despite their many mutual conflicts and divisions. Each Gandhian upsurge represented and concretized a single people in miniature. Gandhi had two images to describe his ideal nation, very far from Savarkar's insistence on perpetual uh, antagonism. His were trusteeship and Ram Rajya. Both admitted that there are inequalities among Indians, yet both suggested that love or mutual care is still possible between those who have power and those who have none. But this hope was difficult to sustain at times, except at peak points of anti-colonial upsurges which drowned out uh, all these differences for the time being. And it, it is very important to see how he tried to come to terms with the intractable problems of social conflict and injustice. And we must give it to Gandhi that he always struggled with difficulties. He never evaded them. We do not necessarily, I think, see either total consistency nor a clear pattern of evolution. There were different tonalities jostling with one another in his thinking, but a few strands, I think, did become more and more pronounced over time. Let's begin with poverty and the class question. He wrote in 1921, and I quote, to a people famishing and idle, the only acceptable form in which God can dare appear is work and promise of food as wages. <coughs> Having acknowledged the pervasiveness and the centrality of Indian poverty, Gandhi then takes a somewhat surprising route. He attributes in Hinswaraj, not always, but in Hinswaraj, he attributes it to a moral failing among the poor. Machine-based production of an infinite number of objects breeds infinite greed, which in turn creates poverty. While everyone shares this craze for modern and useless objects, the poor pay most dearly for it, and their poverty is consolidated by their own unworthy aspirations. The poor, therefore, are responsible for much of their plight. The question of class power and class struggle becomes irrelevant with this, and Gandhi tries to resolve poverty in two ways. One, by asking the poor to be content with what they have and what they do. Second, by reorienting the moral vision of their masters. His trusteeship principle asked property owners to regard their property as a trust that they hold for the benefit of the poor. He admitted, and this is a very important admission, that the rich acquire property by, quote unquote, exploiting the masses. At the same time, what allows them to do so, he said, is their greater competence. So they deserve, in a sense, what they have. Those who are, I quote from him again, those who are capable wish to acquire more. It is natural. The poor, by implication, are less able. <clears throat> no structural change then in production and property relations, but a change in some of the lifestyle and moral practices of both rich and poor. And this is where his differences from the left of those days began. Trusteeship can be better understood in terms of Tulshidas's Ram Charitmanas, whose concept of Ram's realm or Ram Rajya provided the pattern for Gandhi's ideal Swaraj. I quote from him, we call a state Ram Rajya when the relationship between the two, that is between the ruler and his subjects, is as good as that between father and a son. The people are not as wise as he, that is the ruler. 
So once again, uh, end of quote, once again, ruler and subject are divided on the basis of superior and inferior capabilities. Gandhi translates power into hegemony. Hegemony which is built on the active consent and will of the governed, even while the hierarchy between king and subject remains clear, fixed, and naturalized. Gandhi sometimes tried to short circuit a social process by personal example. His self sufficient communes and ashrams did not exploit nor even employ laborers. Inmates were their own cultivators, bakers, cooks, scavengers, sweepers, tailors, shoemakers, etc., etc. Everything that can possibly be needed from <clears throat> laborers. Overthrowing distinctions and taboos about quote unquote clean and unclean work totally. The example, however, was confined to ashrams, it wasn't the pattern for society at large. The personal example was very important, it was an exemplar, but what Gandhi and his associates did was a matter of personal choice. The poor, in contrast, are forced to live a life of non-possession. The self-chosen property, a poverty of the great leader did not address or resolve the brutal privations in their life. On the contrary, it morally privileged and aestheticize them. He assumed the leadership of Champaran and Khera Satyagrahas in Bihar and Gujarat almost as soon as he returned to India. They powerfully challenged European planters and state appropriation of surplus from peasants. So the uncomfortable question of Indian oppressors didn't arise. Gandhi, through these movements, learned how to bring social opposites together on the basis of a concrete grievance against the state that's shared among different classes and castes. This creates unity across classes and avoids social conflict. On the other hand, he almost never allowed the Congress to address or struggle against issues of rent and cess that Indian landlords imposed on tenant cultivators, nor against the exorbitant agrarian interest rates that cultivators were forced to pay to moneylenders. Not even in the terrible years of agrarian depression in the mid-1930s, when indebted cultivators were evicted en masse from their land for defaulting on interest and rent payments. Gandhian resolutions for poverty, the homespun, village school, sanitation, did help the poor peasant to augment their meager incomes in small but very meaningful ways. But they did not help those who faced dispossession from land. Nor did the rich behave as trustees or protectors as he had hoped. As the moral economy of trusteeship failed to materialize, Gandhi reprimanded the peasant or the Adivasi who rebelled rather than the landlord who failed to discharge his paternal responsibilities. Gandhi, of course, valued the peasant as the perfect, the born Satyagrahi. Just as he said that the woman was one, both, uh, uh, both served others without any thought of self. But in order to be so new and none better, how to speak to the peasant? But he did not always speak for the peasant. At the same time, and this is just as important, Gandhi was the first Indian leader who solicited the peasant's entry into the political nation. <clears throat> And the role of the peasant satyagrahi in nation making did create the basis for future democracy in India. It eased in universal adult franchise into our polity without any obvious strife. And that's a huge thing. Gandhi was always critical of urban life, condemning the urban rich and the urban poor in equal measure. Moreover, he deplored the, but at the same time, he deplored the stri strike weapon particularly, denounced class conflicts, distrusted collective bargaining through trade unions, once again inhibiting class protests while leaving mill owners to pursue their methods of control and exploitation. But, and this is what I want to emphasize, 
things changed and his vision unraveled tragically towards the end of his life. His faith in trusteeship was corroded in the dark days of 1946 when he traveled in Bengal villages, trying with his frail body to stop the tide of communal violence. He came to realize how class inequities were, inequalities were mapped onto communal divisions and what a terribly potent brew it was. In June 1947, almost at the end of his life, he suddenly recalled his early attraction towards socialist ideas, class revolution without violence, to which he had never really referred before. He also said that peasants have to struggle for justice for themselves and landlords can help by fleeing. He said that trusteeship had failed and he said that Ram Rajya was really beyond realization. He was big enough to give up on or admit failure of some of his you know, most cherished, most dear visions. I come to caste now via racism. Gandhi, surprisingly, did not characterize racism as an innate property of white-skinned people. He saw it instead as unequal distribution of power, which exists in different forms in different contexts, and I'll give you two examples. In his autobiography, he drew a startling analogy between Hindu untouchability and racism. A barber in South Africa had refused to serve him, and Gandhi couldn't be angry. And I quote from him, We do not allow our own barbers to serve our untouchable brothers. The conviction that it was the punishment for our own sins saved me from becoming angry. He coupled untouchability and racism together stunningly again in the case of the Jalian Walabag massacres. Referring to General Dyer, who gave the order to shoot upon an unarmed crowd at Amritsar in April 1919, and to Michael O'Dwyer, the infamous governor of Punjab, Gandhi wrote immediately after the events 19, <clears throat> in 1921, had not, Neme Nem I, I quote, had not Nemesis overtaken us for the crime of untouchability, have we not practiced diarism and odwyrism on our own kith and kin? In fact, there is no charge that the pariah cannot fling in our faces. Pariah was the British word for untouchables. Pariah cannot fling in our faces, which we do not fling in the faces of Englishmen. There is no charge that the pariah cannot fling in our faces, which we do not fling in the faces of Englishmen. He described, therefore, the massacre as penance, equating the open violence of colonialism with the structural violence of untouchability. In his early life, we all know Gandhi showed a remarkable irreverence for caste orthodoxy, courting, outcasting without penance, the ritual penance when he went abroad. In South Africa, he worked closely with quote-unquote low-caste coolies and invited untouchables into his home on equal terms. He made his family and associates engage in labor that was considered profoundly polluted, shoemaking, leather work, cleaning of toilets. And the preoccupation with cleaning of toilets, uh, one might even say obsession, Work most awfully reprehensible to Savarna or caste Hindus persisted all his life. At Durban, a Dalit Christian clerk stayed in his house as a guest we all know of this famous event. When Gandhi commanded his wife to clean his chamber pot and she refused, in a fit of rage, Gandhi almost turned her out of the house, though he later repented his rage. Once back in India, a Dalit family joined his ashram at Ahmedabad and his patrons immediately withdrew funds to punish him. And there were rumors of a citywide social boycott of Gandhi and the ashram. Gandhi resolved to relocate the ashram at untouchable quarters of the city rather than expel the family from, uh, from, uh, from the ashram. But he had to moderate his activities, as he was simultaneously pressured by two contrary forces. Orthodox Sanatanists on one hand, 
and emergent non-Brahman and Dalit politics on the other. For a, quite a long while, he was more eager to persuade Sanatanis, whom he saw as friendly adversaries, sharing the same religious worldview. He moreover believed that untouchability could be abolished by moral reasoning, that he could teach good Hindus in time, that hereditary caste divisions were a part of their faith, true, but untouchability was not. We must take, I think, one thing very seriously. Gandhi was a sincere, very sincere, very devout Hindu. And Hindu scripture was genuinely sacrosanct to him, to the point of being non-negotiable. He couldn't play around with them. He therefore could not in all honesty deny that caste constituted an essential part of dharma. So he worked endlessly around two incompatible poles, his own passionate repugnance against untouchability and his equally strong commitment to Varnashram Dharma as a religious principle sanctified by scripture. <clears throat> Compromises became inevitable. Pollution taboos were totally abolished in his South African farms and communes. In Indian ashrams, however, their non-observance was voluntary, not mandatory. From 1918, he began to systematically distinguish between Varna and Jati. Varna Dharma, or the fourfold hereditary hierarchical division of society and labor forms, he said, was the core of Dharma. It was immutable. I quote from him. It emanated from the laws of nature or of God. Brahmins were higher in status than Shudras, who must do menial work. But at the same time, Shudra labor should be valued as selfless service. Jati or multiple subdivisions within a Varna on the Avarna, on the other hand, was extraneous and irrelevant to true dharma. A clear binary between Varna and Jati. Untouchability, however, was beyond both a horrible perversion of Hindu faith. He said that respect for all forms of labor, however degraded, was a must. But so was the hereditary division of labor. It was a rational social principle, and in its absence, anarchy will reign. He also strongly upheld the taboo against intervarna marriages and dining uh, till the late 1930s, la later mid-1930s, or even later. In 1924, he plunged into the Vaikom Satyagraha, which had been started by, by Iravas for temple entry in the Hindu princely state of Travancore, in a very conciliatory mode. He told Brahman authorities, and I get this from our late colleague Pandian, Mrs. Pandian, that low castes were already penalized by the gods for their misdeeds in past births, and man should not add to their sufferings. He therefore echoed the theological justification of hierarchy, that low castes were made low, quote unquote, by their own action in past births. He also then described Brahmans as, and I quote again, the finest flowers of Hinduism and humanity. I will do nothing to wither it. But the more he defended the Varna order as benign and just, the more urgent it became to salvage it from the harshness of untouchability. And here rose the nub. He tried out many ways to achieve respect for untouchables. He renamed them Harijana, children of God, which didn't please the more politicized of them. He tried to render, render them physically cleaner, suggesting that they avoid eating leftover food and carrion or meat, uh, flesh of dead animals, with our fil which are filthy as well as sinful habits. They should not touch carcasses of animals and they should bathe and change frequently. He believed that it was their handling of physical filth which made them dirty in the eyes of the world, which lay at the root of pollution and avoidance taboos. Once their bodies were cleansed, the stigma would vanish, even though they'd continue to do the same work. 
but untouchable children told him that if they did not consume leftover food or carrion, they would starve, that they did not have access to water to bathe in or clothes to change into. Reform clearly was not easy. In despair then, he turned to A.S. Altaker, the great scholar of Hinduism, and tried to inquire if scripture could be reread to provide any loopholes. He wrote that he knew that the Smritis did endorse the avoidance rituals and taboos, and possibly also the Vedas. But he hoped that Altaker would be able to translate scripture in a way so that pollution taboos would appear as a consequence of quote-unquote external practice and not of birth. Once again, he tried to appear, uh, attach impurity taboos to impure work. He sought to render them a temporary and not a permanent inherited condition. So work and purity impurity had to be separated. Work had to be done by the same caste in the same way, but impurity should go. The new Dalit politics, however, severely disturbed his definitions and methods. As Dalit leaders began to negotiate with the state about separate electorates spurning their Hindu identity, and as they became relentlessly critical of Congress uh, temporizing on caste, Gandhi's debates with Ambedkar now began to assume the proportions of an epic confrontation. Ambedkar's threat to defect from the Hindu fold dangerously narrowed down the space for maneuver. He overthrew, Ambedkar overthrew Gandhi's distinction between acceptable Varnadharma and impermissible untouchability, insisting that the two are integrally connected. He demanded the annihilation of caste itself as social and economic system, as ideology, as ritual practice. He demanded a politics of distribution as well as of recognition. But he also said that it was Gandhi who first brought the issue of untouchability into the forefront of national politics, and no one could have done it the way he did. Gandhi's responses to Ambedkar were more complex. Initially, he took Ambedkar to be an upper caste person because of his educational achievements and social confidence. He wasn't the typical abject Dalit. His first comments were somewhat patronizing, and I quote, he has received a liberal education. He has more than the talents of an average educated interior, uh, Indian. His exterior is clean, though his interior is a mystery. You know why he had to refer to his cleanliness is a bit surprising. He insisted that untouchables didn't need Ambedkar as they had the Congress to lead them. At the second roundtable conference, he went further, and I quote, I myself, in my own person, claim to speak for the whole of untouchables. He asked them to forget their own grievances and to serve the nation and the national movement first to which Ambedkar replied in unforgettable words, Mahatmaji, do I have a country? The issue of representation brought about a deadlock as Ambedkar made it clear that the Congress could not represent nor lead untouchables. They have to throw up their own leaders. Gandhi, on the other hand, objected till the mid-30s to an independent sphere of politics. They should seek neither legal redress nor political autonomy nor activism on their own. The burden of social transformation must lie with upper caste alone. They will repent first and then reform society and nation. The burden, however, is actually a privilege. Just as it underlined upper caste guilt and underlined it very powerfully and passionately, it also vested political agency solely in them, rendering the Dalit a passive victim. Rejuvenated and redeemed by penitence, upper caste would then rightfully reclaim their trusty status and reform low caste. It was, therefore, a return to hierarchy on a higher plane. But neither Sanatanis nor the upper caste showed any signs of relenting or repenting. And this now put his faith 
more precious to him than his own life in a state of total crisis. He wrote poignantly in 1933, and I quote, it's a very moving quote. There is nothing so bad in all the world as untouchability. He's writing at the peak of the anti-colonial movements. He's leading them, and he says there's nothing so bad in all the world as untouchability. My life would be a burden to me if Hinduism failed me. But then I cannot tolerate it with untouchability. He now began to say that it was better for untouchables to fight against slow caste southerners than to live as, and I quote him again, wretched slaves. And most significant of all for a person like Gandhi, I quote, if this kind of untouchability were an integral part of dharma, that religion has no use for me. Gandhi was beginning to change. At the end of his life, he became ready to accept a legal constitutional prohibition of untouchability. Earlier, he had never endorsed inter-Varna marriages, at the most intra-jati marriages, marriages within the same jati. Now he advised upper caste girls to marry untouchable men, disobeying the uh, prohibition on pratiluma or hypogamous marriages so loathsome to Hindu orthodoxy. Ashish Nandi has argued that it was this that made him so dangerous a man to his enemies, along, of course, with his defense of equal rights for Indian Muslims and Christians. His assassin, Nathuram Godse, let's remember, was an orthodox Maharashtrian from the purest of Brahman categories. Gandhian anti-colonial movements prefigured one kind of nation, populated with caste and class-divided subjects who nonetheless possessed political agency and hence had democratic entitlements. Most strikingly, however, I find his nation was capable of recognizing its own contradictions and oppressions and feel guilty about them. This capacity for introspection, for recognizing evil within itself, was the most important thing about Gandhi's nation. A nation that refuses to feel guilty about itself is a nation to fear deeply. Thank you. Thank you, Tonika. Uh, Tonika Sarkar will now be taking some questions. So, this is a question I'm just art articulating. It's a demand, a public demand from many of us. Since you adopted a contrastive structure, you contrasted Gandhi's idea of nation with a wide range of people from Savarkar to Ambedkar, can you please say a few words about the ideas of nationalism of Rabindranath Tagore in a, t in a time because at one hand the self-proclaimed defenders of nationalism are defining Tagore only as the composer of India's national anthem and on the other hand if we look at the writings of Tagore on nationalism probably he would now share a cell with Kanhaya or Umar as a seditionist and anti-nationalist so, so a few comments Thank you. Uh, I didn't address this. Uh, this is an important question, and I didn't address this because uh, I was short of time. Uh, but, uh, you know, don't be sure that the national anthem would stay as the national anthem for a long while, uh, you know, in the times to come, because it's been a long standing demand of the RSS that it should be replaced with Bande Mataram. You know, Bande Mataram occurs in a novelistic context uh, where uh, 
uh, you know, <laughs> Hindus are being, in, you know, sort of inspired, are being asked to go into war with Muslims, you know, and uh, to destroy their mosques, to destroy their houses, etc., etc. So it seems to be a much more appropriate uh, national anthem for our times. Uh, I hesitate to speak about Tagore's stance on nationalism because, you know, I fear a ban on all his works immediately. But since Bodhisattva Kaur and uh, um, Shugata Bosch today have already written at length about it, he said nationalism was an evil. Unmitigated evil, the nationalism of the... Uh, of the conquerors, of the colonizers, because nationalism has an ingrained will to power, to conquest, as well as the nationalism of the conquered, the colonized. Because, and he warned about this again and again, that unless we go through a rigorous process of self-correction, and self-correction in terms of addressing peasant distress and untouchability, about both of which he became painfully aware from the time of the Swadeshi movement. Unless we address and resolve these problems first, the nation that will come in would be a vicious nation, a vicious form of self-governance. And we can't then blame these on foreign rule. Uh, he had acrimonious exchanges with Gandhi about this, about the priority uh, to be accorded to internal problems or to the, you know, uh, the all-embracing problem of colonialism. And these arguments lasted, you know, Tagore's life and Gandhi's life, uh, never properly resolved. But there was you know, a great mutual respect between Gandhi and Nehru. Uh, Gandhi, uh, sorry, uh, Tagore called him Mahatma for the first time, and Gandhi gave him the name Gurudev, by which he was generally known. Um, I think that more or less addresses if there's anything else uh, that I need to say. But by the way, we all have our own Gandhi, huh? So my Gandhi is that, you know, when he was walking around Noakhali villages unarmed and, you know, uh, with a few men and women with him. Was the British their great Indian empire, but the British didn't kill him. He walked unarmed through Noakhali, a place where there had been considerable uh, Muslim violence and in 46. And the Muslims were angry with Gandhi because he was not going to Bihar where there was great violence against Muslims. But he walked through Noakhali villages unarmed and the Muslims didn't kill him. It wasn't the Muslims who killed him, it wasn't the British who killed him. But while he was going round the Noakhali villages, a song of Tagore was on his lips all the time. Uh, if no one responds to your call, then you have to walk alone. Akla Chalure. And maybe he was thinking of Tagore's warning, because at this time, this was the time when he was recalling his socialist past and so on. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for a uh, very informative lecture. Uh, I just have one question, it might be slightly off topic, but uh, within the European left, uh, there is a certain section which is debating uh, Gram Samudai and Gandhi's concept of nation. And uh, my uh, response, or my off-the-cuff response to that sort of an argument, although I am nowhere uh, nearly qualified to uh, refute or even uh, analyze it critically, was that how do we uh, address the question of the caste system? If such a uh, such an idea of a nation state, of such a uh, uh, if such an if an egalitarian pro uh, project is framed within these terms, how would we address this question? Uh, if you could please uh, throw some light on it, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, you know, Gandhi's question of Gram Swaraj was, in a sense. Uh, a notion of grassroots democracy that we have to acknowledge. 
And uh, scholars have said that it was this that appealed to the peasants most, more than even political independence, that they would be in control of their political economic destinies. That had tremendous appeal. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. How do we, uh, you know, how do we, um, you know, tackle the problem of caste within the small unit of a caste-ridden village? And what we see of Khap panchayats nowadays has problematized that even more so, but we can't also uh, easily dismiss the idea of grassroots democracy. Uh, is there any more questions? Uh, uh, Ma'am, I just wanted to ask you about uh, what you said about Gandhi being a devout Hindu and therefore his belief in Hindu scripture was therefore non-negotiable for him. And however still, so in the ashrams he was al almost obviously, uh, you know, very subversive with whatever that scripture was prescribing for him as a caste Hindu. So I'm just sort of unable to understand why did he then believe that his, uh, you know, why then did he believe that that adherence to Hindu scripture was non-negotiable? And as in, why is that reluctance to then sort of, uh, you know, explicitly uh, just re renounce it? Important question, and of course it's a uh, very difficult to go through all the volumes of collected works of Mahatma Gandhi and maybe others would have a, uh, an answer to this, but what little I have seen of Gandhi's writings, he himself does not explain his very early radicalism, which was a very surprising thing for a person born in a rather orthodox, extremely orthodox family. Where he got it from, why it was so important to him from the beginning, he does not quite uh, answer that question. But um, at the same time, there was his faith that, or there was his conviction that untouchability, remember, in the South African ashrams, untouchability, or even later, untouchability was the purity pollution taboos were what he completely spurned. He did not talk about, at that point of time, before he came back to India, about what is Varna, what is Jati, what is, uh, you know, how much of that should we retain as part of scripture, how much of that is to be thrown out because it's not part of scripture, and so on. And uh, maybe his own personal acquaintance with a vast and plural range of scripture was not yet very... Uh, you know, very deep. Uh, so he thought probably that he could experiment with these things without challenging the core things of Hinduism. But when he was brought face to face with Sanatanist arguments that look into any part of the scriptural tradition and you will find an endorsement of caste and untouchability, he started to say, no, it's not caste, but it's, uh, sorry, it's not untouchability, but it's caste, okay? And this was a very genuine engagement with the religious tradition that he had because he, uh, you know, we too, these days sometimes rather lightly say that we will appropriate religious traditions to subvert them. It's not that easy, you know, and Gandhi being embedded in Hindu religious tradition knew it very well that religion is not infinitely elastic it has some non-negotiables within it but at the end he said I have no use if that is so I don't want to believe it is so but if that is so that untouchability is you know unavoidable then I have no use for it and ultimately, that kind of skepticism, uh, you know, sort of spread even to the question of caste.
thank you, friends. I don't think we can take any more questions now because we have some other program lined up. I'd like to ask Jan Kinaya to come and make some announcement, and then we have a uh, music performance by Shekhar Pat. First, let me begin by thanking you once more, uh, Tanika Sarkar, for a superb uh, talk in the series. I am thrilled that this has been such a successful series of lectures, uh, not only to those who are gathered here, but people who are watching this online, and it continues to be watched uh, throughout the week. I hope some of our news anchors from the noise channels are watching uh, these uh, lectures as well. They need this education, and today we have heard about that other Gujarati, who we all need to remember in these hard times. So, uh, thank you very, very much for this uh, lecture. Uh, I do want to also apologize to uh, those of you who have been gathering here daily, because we did announce a daily uh, teach-in, but for various reasons, these plans have been changing. Bear with us. This is a political struggle. Things will change. But uh, we will have tomorrow Professor Achin Vanayak speaking on the power of nationalism. And day after, Madhila, may I commit you to speaking on Saturday, uh, the talk which was supposed to be happening, uh, supposed to have happened yesterday by Professor Mridula Mukherjee will happen on Saturday. I request you all to come. We now have a team who is going to run this teach-in and a future set of lectures will be announced perhaps on Saturday itself. <laughs>